They spent a long time arguing about the form their participation should take. Alex settled the argument by grabbing a handgun and shouting, This is how I'm participating. I'm going to get him. Carmen's brother hesitated. He said he didn't want to hurt innocent people. Carmen stuffed a gun into her purse, pulled Alec out of their apartment, and shouted at the other two, You're already too late, and there won't be a next time. Carmen and Alec walked th through excited crowds toward the bar where the regional heroin dealer did his business. Eric and Carmen's brother followed them. There were no police protectors near the bar. That day they were busy elsewhere, and the heart of the riot area was not the safest place for them. Alec and Carmen moved toward the bar, shouting, Get the dough pushers and clear out the rats. At the bar entrance, they both pulled out their guns and shouted, This is the origin of all the heroin, and here's the biggest rat in the community. An enormous crowd gathered in front of the bar. Some people shouted encouragement. Most people stared curiously. Alec and Carmen entered the bar waving their guns, but the crowd attracted the attention of the forces of law and order. A tank and a National Guard unit were provoked by it. The tank aimed its gun at the heart of the crowd, and the soldiers started beating people, forcing them to disperse. Eric was separated from Carmen's brother, but kept his eyes glued to the entrance of the bar. He saw Alec and Carmen come out grinning victoriously, still waving their guns. Eric shouted as loudly as he could to them pointlessly. Alec and Carmen turned and st started to run back into the bar. They were shot down by machine guns. Mingy, that's awful. Eric still has nightmares about it. That was an awful thing to see. Carmen's brother committed suicide a few days later. Minnie was shaking. I helped her lie down on the couch and put a blanket over her. I was crying. I shook this way for days when Eric told me about it, and I still shake whenever I think about it. I had opposed Alec's vigilante terrorism from its origins, but I disintegrated when Eric told me how Alec and Carmen died. Maybe you're right. Maybe that was the only way to translate our commitment into practice. I can't help admiring their courage. Pickle as he was, Alec remained true to the one goal he set himself. Ever since his encounter with Sabina, he had convinced himself he couldn't coexist with the ruling order, and he lived and died for that conviction. Eric wanted to commit suicide, too. He felt he had no right to be the only one alive. He had pledged himself to the group, and he felt he had betrayed Alec and Carmen by letting them venture out by themselves. He knew that if he and Carmen's brother had stood guard outside the bar, they would have known about the arrival of the National Guard, and they'd have warned Alec and Carmen in time. They could all have escaped by the bar's rear entrance. Instead, they had to let Alec and Carmen emerge proudly into what they expected to be a cheering and welcoming crowd, the grateful community. Eric tortured himself with guilt. He knew the same thoughts had led Carmen's brother to kill himself. I revived Minnie somewhat with a drink and asked, Where's Eric now? Eric and I live together, she told me. We have since the riot. He works in an auto plant, and he's one of the five people in the new political tendency we started several months ago. He's a very gentle and considerate person, and very scrupulous about sharing the work as well as the burdens. I'm sure you'll like him. Before Minnie left, I asked her if she knew what had happened to the other people we had known during our university days, and I told her all I knew about Lem, Rhea, as well as Damon. I never heard of Thurston or Bess again, she told me. I read about Hugh in a newspaper sometime recently. He's some kind of authority in one of the sciences. I think the article was about a lecture he was to deliver at a suburban college. Hugh? A lecturer? I'll try to look him up, Sophie. If I find him and he's nearby, should I ask if he could get together with us? I'd love that, Minnie. I try not to cry anymore until Minnie left. Her account of Alec's life and his horrid death stirred up a great deal in my life, too. I had been so vicious to him. In the end, Alec, like Jose, had tried to act out, at least in some practical form, the project I had only dreamed about. In his own way, Alec had been a natural and had died like him. When Minnie and I parted, we both knew we were going to be seeing a lot of each other from now on. Your letter arrived two days after Minnie's visit, and Damon telephoned later that day. As I've learned to expect, Damon forgot everything that's happened recently, except for the fact that I'm out of a job. It's an opening that doesn't call for any higher credentials than a master's degree. I thought you might be interested, in case you're still out of a job. I'm out of a job, Damon, and out of a project, but I'm not interested in another teaching job. How about coming over just to talk? About old times? About Alec, for instance? I can't, Sophie, he told me. I've suddenly got more things to do than I have time. I thought I had recruited Louisa, but it turns out she recruited me to that committee of hers. The repression committee, I asked? If you won't come over to talk, then how about giving Ted and me a ride to the repression committee? He still hasn't gotten his car back. It was impounded by the police. And he'd love to see you again. He was so impressed by you ten years ago. He still remembers you. Except for an excursion he'd taken with Sabina to try to get his car back, Ted had been spending his days the same way I had, moping around the house with nothing to do. Ted had in fact told me he'd like to see the people who had visited me in the garage. He had liked Alec a great deal, and he thought they were all like Alec. But Ted must have been disappointed. Damon came, shook Ted's hand, showing no sign he had ever seen Ted before, 
and told him, Nice seeing you again. How many years were you in jail because of that heroin business? Ted and Damon had nothing more to say to each other on the way to the repression committee. In the car, I asked Damon if he knew how Alec had died. Of course, he told me. He was gunned down in last year's riot. Why didn't you tell me? I'm sorry, Sophie. I learned about it a month after it happened, and I didn't see you for almost a year after that. I guess I forgot. But you never forget to tell me about openings for college instructors. I said I was sorry, Sophie. And what's so odd about my telling you about a job openings when I know you need a job? Nothing, Damon. Absolutely nothing. You have a perfect sense of timing. I was referring to something he told me a year ago, right after I'd been fired from the first job he'd helped me find. He didn't seem to recognize the reference. Damon is such a bizarre person. He seems to have a different set of standards and pattern of behavior for each of the compartments in which he lives his life. I tried to get close to him during my year in graduate school. I felt very lonely among students who were 10 years younger than I. Their concerns and interests had little in common with mine. I've never been spontaneously sociable, and until a few weeks ago, the possibility of forming a liaison with a lover 10 years younger than I never crossed my mind. Damon told me about interesting political events. He chatted briefly afterwards, but he didn't once pick me up or take me home. He didn't become a friend until I got my degree three years ago, when he helped me get my first teaching job. I became his colleague, and therefore also his friend a year and a half after I first enrolled in his course. I was hired to teach one course. His teaching day began at noon, and I taught my course on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the afternoon. For the first day of classes, he picked me up and drove me to school. I read on the grass or in the library until his teaching day ended, and then he drove me back home. One Tuesday afternoon, he invited me to dinner at his apartment. I learned what it was that Minnie and later Louisa liked about him. In the privacy of his apartment, he was an altogether transformed Damon. All his personal and political rigidity were gone. He was the most thoughtful and considerate man I've ever been close to. I learned that he always cooked supper for himself, not to save money, but because he preferred his own meals to anything he could order in restaurants. And the meal he prepared for me really was splendid. Louisa is a good cook, but not compared to Damon. He washed all the dishes as soon as we were done eating, and that first night he didn't even let me dry them. After coffee and a brief chat, he volunteered to drive me home, unless you'd like to go out on the town, which of course I did. We went to a movie that was shown in a university auditorium. When we came out, I put my hand in his and had him retrace the walk we had taken exactly ten years earlier when we carried the coffin of the dead university newspaper. He didn't realize we had retraced the path of that mock funeral until the very end when we stopped before the closed entrance of the building in which the newspaper office was located. He looked at me sadly. I know how much that meant to you, Sophie. It meant a lot to me, too. I asked him, Would you mind taking me back to your apartment? I had fallen in love with Damon's apartment and with Damon's behavior inside it. His apartment was clean and modest, yet extremely comfortable. It was an absolute contrast to Art's filthy little reading room with an unmade bed. Damon did all his work in his office in the university. He used his apartment for cooking, eating, reading, and sleeping, and everything in his apartment was perfectly arranged to make these activities as enjoyable as they could be. He had a double bed, but I didn't ask if anyone had shared it with him before me. He had broken up with Minnie long before he'd been able to afford that apartment. Since all his acquaintances were political, and since he didn't mix politics with his private life, I didn't see how he could have a sexual relationship with any other woman, unless she had invited herself as I had. Damon's compartments were so mutually exclusive that he didn't keep any political or philosophical books in his apartment. His single shelf contained only literary classics, and of all things, books of poetry. I'd never imagined Damon sitting in his apartment, reading poetry, but I had never imagined the rest of his private life either. For slightly less than a year, I was fired before the end of the school year, I lived with Damon two days out of every week, from Tuesday at noon, when he picked me up for my first class, to Thursday afternoon, when he drove me back after my last. I remember those days with a certain nostalgia. Unlike art, Damon took nothing for granted. Every Tuesday afternoon, before driving to his apartment, he scrupulously asked, where to? He sometimes let me help cook, but I didn't once cook alone, and I never did the shopping. I washed dishes only when he wasn't home for dinner, which happened very rarely, and on those occasions he left a prepared meal for me in the refrigerator. Unlike any other man I've known, I never lived with you. Damon understood that not knowing how to cook or clean or wash dishes presupposed the existence of proletarians, women proletarians, who knew how to do all these things. He did all this for himself, not ostentatiously, but quietly and matter-of-factly. His entire apartment was spotless whenever I stepped into it. I never once even had a chance to make the bed. He hurriedly did that while I brushed my teeth. In his apartment, he was the most decent and thoughtful person I've known. But as soon as his social role was in question, 
or what he took to be mine, he became insupportable. On the job he helped me find three years ago, I was supposed to teach a conventional course in introductory sociology. I immediately turned it into the only study of society that interested me, the study of its overthrow. I had been told to use one of two standard textbooks, but I didn't read or assign or discuss either textbook. I gave out a list of books containing most of the titles I had taken to Jose in prison. The classroom sessions were political arguments about revolutions and liberation movements. In the record books, I gave all students the highest mark whether or not I had ever seen them. I quickly gained a reputation as a faculty radical, and students not enrolled in my class started to attend it in order to engage in political arguments. Members of student political groups asked me to be the faculty sponsor of their organizations, a formality which was needed for them to have access to university facilities. I also attended some of the meetings of the groups I sponsored, and I learned something of the unromantic side of the student movement. I saw the politicians and manipulators transforming rebellious students into passive tools. I saw what you've called the grand puppet show, but I didn't generalize from such insights and experiences. I vaguely agreed with Damon that the genuine revolutionary movement would in any case not begin among students, but in the factories, at the point of production. I had learned that from Louisa. I didn't figure out that the organization of the working class, which was going to make that revolution possible, the union in all its various shapes and forms, played the same role in the factories as the politicians and manipulators played among the rebellious students. I only learned that very recently, and largely from you, although last year's riot gave me some clues. Everything that was organized, from the state to the tiniest radical sect, was opposed to the spontaneous carnival atmosphere that suddenly took hold of the city. The riot broke out when my second teaching term was half over. I thought what I had always waited for was at last happening. Massive rebellion broke out into the streets. Whole blocks of buildings burned. Carefully priced commodities circulated as freely as confetti. I wanted to be part of it all and drifted into my usual style. A man trying to run with two television sets shouted to me to grab one of them. I ran home with it as proudly as if I'd carried out a revolutionary act. When I next met with my class, I was almost angry at students who hadn't taken part in the looting. As I told you in one of my first letters, I was promptly fired. But when I lost my job, my relationship with Damon ended in a bitter argument. I wasn't particularly upset about losing the job, since the pay was scandalously low, and I hated being part of the academic bureaucracy. But Damon was flushed with anger. A classroom isn't the best place to carry picket signs, he shouted at me when I told him why I had been fired. I was encouraging students to loot, riot, and steal instead of sitting in that stuffy room listening to an idiot like me. He retorted, the revolution isn't going to break out in a university classroom. I told him I didn't expect anything at all to happen in a university classroom. That was when he told me, you have a bad sense of timing, Sophie. I blew up. Totally unlike you, Damon. You have a perfect sense of timing and placing and cataloging. You have a different mask for every cubby hole you move through. Anger for political meetings, condescension for classrooms, courage for strikes, submissiveness for meetings with superiors, kindness for animals, and a decency only in the privacy of your apartment. You're not a human being, but a filing cabinet. He tried to respond patiently, namely condescendingly. Sophie, if you're going to keep a teaching job, I broke in, crying with frustrated anger. Don't you understand what the riot meant? People expressed and asked just how they feel about the precious institutions you serve. They hate those institutions. They feel oppressed by them. They'd like nothing better than to burn all of them to the ground. Don't you feel the slightest bit ashamed to parade in front of that classroom exercising authority given to you by the state? He walked away from me. His face expressed shocked disbelief. I called him about a month later to apologize for my outburst and to thank him for all he had done for me. I didn't hear from him again for over a year. When Damon had called four days ago to tell me about yet another job opening, I had told him I wanted to talk to him and that Ted was eager to see him again. But neither Ted nor I said anything to him for the rest of our trip to the building where the repression committee has its offices. It was only when we were inside the building that it occurred to me to ask, Why did Louisa recruit you into this committee, Damon? What in the world do you do here? Stuff envelopes? He told me Louisa feels the committee's work lacks political direction. She thinks I can help provide a certain amount of coherence by taking part in some of the activities. For instance, by contributing a certain amount of research and simply by engaging in some of the discussions. I commented sarcastically, so you're sort of an ideological director of the enterprise? Damon snickered but missed my sarcasm altogether. I suppose you could call it that. Something like the minister of the committee's ideological department, I went on. He said almost with pride, I wouldn't quite go that far. No, I suppose you don't expect to reach the state of government portfolios until after the revolution. It's not a question of revolution here, but of repression, he told me, adding the expected, the question of revolution is going to be resolved on the shop floor. What are you doing here, then, I asked him. I thought the only task of a revolutionary was to... 
Damon didn't respond. We had both heard each other's arguments before. He escorted Ted and me to a room full of people, the room I had walked into after last year's riot. Louisa came rushing toward Damon. This is Ted, the printer, Damon told her. Without even looking at me, Louisa shook Ted's hand eagerly and told him, I really enjoyed my lesson in printing, and I can't tell you how glad I am that you came here. The committee acquired a printing press a few days ago, but no one here is able to get it going. She was called away to the telephone. While talking on the phone, she asked Damon if he had finished an article. He handed it to her. She glanced at it, continuing her phone conversation, and then handed it to a young woman who was typing. When she got off the phone, she asked Ted, Would you mind having a look at that printing machine? I had rarely seen Louisa at work. I wondered if this was the Louisa you had known in the carton plant, if this was the Louisa who had recruited Nachalo into the Genuine Workers' Organization. She seemed just like a political boss. The activity in that room was identical to the activity that had finally repelled me years ago, when I tried to escape from the drudgery of my job in the fiberglass factory. Yet Louisa didn't seem at all bored. I suppose the fact that she's held the same factory job for 20 years indicates that her tolerance for boredom is infinitely higher than mine. But she didn't seem merely to tolerate the boredom. She seemed to enjoy it, to be fulfilled by it, the way monks and nuns seem fulfilled while performing dull tasks. The gratification doesn't come from the senses, but from the knowledge that every moment of drudgery is yet another service performed for the Lord, or in Louisa's case, for the organization. It struck me that the room I was looking at was something like a microcosm of all Louisa's organizations. The activity in and of itself is the dullest, most repetitious activity performed in the bureaucratic society, but this activity is transformed into something gratifying and enjoyable the moment a Damon, an Alberts, or a Zabrin define its political direction. The purpose of her organizing has been to provide the political directors with staffs of flunkies. How ludicrous it is that Damon, that caricature of a fragmented human being, himself a patchwork of contradiction, himself unable to connect his politics with the other closed compartments that compose his life, should be the one to provide political direction to others. And how scandalous that Louisa should have sacrificed her own life to the task of recruiting independent spirits to the service of such gods. When I had asked Damon to take Ted and me to the repression committee, I had forgot that Art Sinich might be there. It was in that very room that I had seen Art after last year's riot. And of course Art was there, and he rushed over to me as soon as he saw me. I wasn't glad to see him, but I shook his hand and asked if he had time to accompany me to a nearby coffee shop for a chat. I wanted to learn just how Art had come to be living in my room at Louise's house until a few weeks ago. I ended up treating Art to lunch and several cups of coffee. It turns out that Art's life was far more intertwined with mine than I had ever imagined. I learned yet another time that the radical community in this city with millions of people is like a closed, incestuous family, and by now I probably know every member of it. I also got a view of yet another ugly underside of that community. Art had met Louisa long before I had ever walked into the Peace Movement building. When I saw them both in the Repression Committee last year, I thought they had met there. I didn't imagine they had known each other during the years when I hadn't seen Louisa. Art met Lemisel as long as seven years ago. Lem had just returned from his harrowing prison experience after trying to deliver my letters and was living with Debbie Matthews. Art was already involved in peace movement activity when Lem first walked into the Peace Center. I met Louisa at a third world rally, Art told me. Lem introduced me to a university friend of his, and Louisa was with this friend. That friend, of course, was Alec. Everyone I knew must have been at that rally. I was in the fiberglass factory when it took place. It's funny the three of you didn't run into each other when you came to the Peace Center, he said. I must have seen Lem at least four or five times during the weeks when you came to the Peace Center, but Lem didn't bring Louisa there until after you did me the favor of looking up the maid service phone number for me. He introduced me to Louisa again, although I remembered her from the rally. Of course, Lem didn't know I knew you, and I couldn't know Louisa was your mother. Eventually, Lem dropped out of peace movement activities altogether, but Louisa got more and more involved. Louisa and I found that we understood each other much better than she and Lem ever had. He started to look for ways to escape from responsibilities that we can't run away from, but neither of us could help him understand that. He wanted to be a hermit, and since one of my relatives owned an abandoned estate, Louisa and I took him to the type of environment he said he wanted. Louisa was generous enough to invite me to replace Lem in her house. Even then, I didn't know I was in your house, Sophie. There wasn't a single photograph of you in it. She helped me understand a lot of things correctly, but she couldn't get me to understand that the people she called workers, people who filled their houses with material things, could be called oppressed. I didn't really understand the meaning of oppression until after last year's riot, when this committee got started. When I saw you last year, I had just left the peace movement after almost ten years of involvement. When I saw Art last year, I had just been fired from my first teaching job. The money I had saved when I had worked in the fiberglass factory had run out during my year in graduate school, 
and I hadn't been able to save any of the money I'd earned from my teaching job. I wasn't worried about starving to death, but I didn't want Sabina or Tina to pay my bills. So I took advantage of one of the indirect benefits brought about by the riot. Immediately after the riot, state institutions, which dispense relief to the poor, ironically called welfare, became temporarily flexible as well as generous. I had drawn a small amount of unemployment compensation after I'd been fired from the fiberglass factory, but being fired from a teaching job didn't qualify me for that type of subsidy. So I went on welfare. And it was in a welfare office that I received a leaflet announcing a demonstration sponsored by the Committee Against Repression, Incorporated. There were many strange things about the leaflet besides the name of the sponsor, but it did condemn the wanton killings carried out by the police, and it rightly pointed out that the police were the only ones who had rioted during the riot. This had been perfectly clear to me. The redistribution of consumer goods had been carried out in a very orderly and cooperative manner, in the spirit of a feast or a carnival, certainly not a riot. Yet all the newspapers had described the events with words that suggested uninterrupted and limitless violence. There were many fires, but they were systematically limited to enterprises that were known to practice the worst exploitation and extortion. I went to the demonstration on the date announced on the leaflet. The event attracted 30 demonstrators, if that many. The group took a two-hour walk along city sidewalks carrying signs with terribly unimaginative slogans. More than half the demonstrators left along the way. I stayed with the group, more out of curiosity than conviction. Imagine my surprise when someone behind me grabbed my arm and I turned and saw Louisa. I hadn't seen her since the night when I had returned home after hunting for Hugh and discovered her on the living room couch with Alec. In another seven years, I wouldn't have recognized you, she told me. She invited me to visit the group's office and proudly gave me a tour around the envelopes, the addressing machines, and the stacks of mimeograph leaflets marked press release. It was similar to the envelope stuffing room at the Peace Center. I imagine that the advertising offices from which the ruling class manipulates the society of consumers must also be similar, only a lot less messy and with swept floors, since they could afford to pay their proletarians. We weren't very friendly to each other. We both remembered how we'd parted, and we both remembered the brief phone conversation we'd had shortly after we parted, when neither of us had expressed any interest in seeing each other again. I asked sarcastically when she had graduated from shop floor organizing to working with a committee incorporated. She told me she had become politically active again two years after I had left her, when a young man by the name of Lem introduced her to the peace movement. But the politics of those people were atrocious, and this committee's work is much more like the work I'd like to do. I asked her what she'd done during the riot, and the vehemence with which she opposed it amazed me. Among other things, she cited, Wants and attacks on the productive forces are not a revolution. The workers I fought with aimed to appropriate the productive forces, not to destroy them. She had stayed home during the riot, listening to her radio. It sounded awful, she told me, a vast release of pent-up frustration without any political direction or program. She got interested only when the repressive forces of the state had transformed the riot into a real riot. We're exposing the fact that property is valued far higher than human life, she started to tell me, but someone called her away to the phone, telling her, this is your department, Louisa, some radical union caucus. She excused herself and picked up the phone. I smiled to her coldly, indifferently, as I backed out of the Committee Against Repression Incorporated, out of the building, and out to the street. Just as I reached the fresh air, I ran into Art Sinich on his way into the same building. At that time, I didn't connect him with Lem or with Louisa, and I didn't ask him how or when he had moved from the peace movement to the Repression Committee. We stood by the building entrance and chatted briefly. He wanted to invite me back up to the office, but I told him I'd already seen it. Neither he nor I knew that the bed in which he spent his nights had once been mine. I was much more curious about Art when I invited him to coffee four days ago. I asked him how he managed to re reconcile his peace philosophy with the significantly different outlook of the repression committee. I still don't condone violence, he told me, but Louisa helped me understand that the violence of the oppressed isn't the same as the violence of the oppressor. She helped me understand that liberation can only be achieved through organization. The committee is devoted to the belief that the oppressed races carry on the seeds of liberation. You learned that from Louisa? I asked with disbelief. Louisa doesn't agree with every one of the organization's positions, he told me. I was relieved to learn that. I asked him how Louisa's position differed from the organization's. He launched into a tirade that made my head swim. Ever since she asked me to leave her house, she's been acting funny toward me and toward the rest of the committee, he told me. She claims to bring that politics professor to the committee in order to give the committee political direction, but in my opinion, she's trying to wreck the committee. It's becoming clear to me that she doesn't really understand the problem of oppression. She doesn't understand that every race of people must struggle for their survival and freedom. 
and she doesn't understand the real purpose of the committee. She and her professor friends seem to be stuck in the old belief that the key to revolution is some kind of mass movement. They don't know that the key to revolution today is a race, racial movement. They don't see that we won't ever become a mass movement. We seek to maximize the power and influence we can as an organized minority. We serve the needs of other organizations, and we serve to educate the public at large. We aim to coordinate the activities of organizations expressing the will of national and racial minorities. I hurriedly paid the bill and rushed out of the coffee shop. The hodgepodge that constituted art's new philosophy had a familiar, ugly ring to it. I returned to the repression committee and looked for Ted. I had a headache and wanted to go home with him. I went to the press room behind the office to look for him. Suddenly, I froze in my tracks. What I felt must have been similar to what you felt 20 years ago when you stopped behind a pillar and watched Louisa walk out of the carton plant with her arm in Mark Glavney's. Ted was bending over the press, tightening or loosening something with a wrench. Louisa was learning by holding onto Ted's waist with her left hand, her whole body leaning over Ted's, her cheek almost rubbing against his. Yes, of course I was jealous, intensely so. But it wasn't only jealousy that infuriated me. I suddenly saw Louisa's entire life project. I suddenly understood Louisa's union. I suddenly grasped how and why Louisa had so successfully combined her sexual with her political activity. Damon the researcher, Damon the spokesman of our movement, Damon the shepherd, was in the other room providing political direction. But some of the sheep, namely Art and his friends, were already under the tutelage of a different shepherd, and the political d director was on the verge of being left without followers. The shepherd's dog was using her entire body to recruit a new sheep into the flock, to provide her political director with a new follower. This was Louisa's revenge for the scene I had made with Pat. I trembled with fury as I moved toward them. Louisa turned her back to me as soon as she saw me. She told Ted, we could sure use the talents of an experienced printer around here. Would you be willing to continue my lesson some other time and to show the rest of the staff how this machine works? Ted acquiesced. Sure, I don't have many other things to do right now. Louisa started to walk past me out of the room. I grabbed her arm and told her, if you think you're the one who has a gripe against me, Louisa, get it out of your head this minute. She shook herself out of my grasp and pulled me through the office and out the hall. All right, Sophia, let's have it out once and for all. Why did you ruin my relationship with Damon? I only wish I had ruined it, I shouted, but I obviously failed to ruin your relationship to your authority, your God. I just caught you in the act of sacrificing another victim to him. Louisa pulled me all the way out to the street, where she shouted, We're going to have it out, you and I, but you're not going to embarrass me one more time. She hailed a cab, pulled me inside, and told the driver to take us to her house. All right, now holler all you want, she told me in the back of the cab, releasing me. Don't you accuse me of destroying anything, Louisa. You devoured countless human lives for the sake of those beloved authorities of yours, those professors with a working-class project in their heads. Leave Ted alone, would you? Didn't you have your fill with Nachalo and Yaristan and Alec? You're feverish with jealousy, Sophia. You're the most conventional, spiteful, narrow. I used to think that you loved Nachalo. I admired you for that love, but you destroyed him. You dragged everything he stood for through the mud. Stick to your present jealousy, you idiot, and don't talk about things you don't know anything about, she shouted. She paid for the cab, and I followed her into her house. How long did you expect me to go on knowing nothing about Nachalo, I asked her. We both sat down in the living room, where I had so recently flaunted my independence from her. I know that Ted is another Nachalo to you. Sabina told me all about what Nachalo stood for, and now I know he had nothing in common with that organization you served, or its so-called popular army. George Alberts told her. Whatever George Alberts told her was a lie, she shouted. He spent his life justifying his betrayal of his comrades at the front. When did you decide Alberts was lying, I asked her. When Titus Zabrin returned from the front and told you Nachula had died like a hero, fighting alongside Zabrin and Alberts in the popular army? That conflicted with what Alberts told you, didn't it? Alberts told you he and Zabrin had fought against people like Nachula, didn't he? You're raving about things you can't know anything about, Sophia. Alberts couldn't have told Sabina anything until ten years after the event, and he couldn't have remembered anything. When he returned from the front, he was delirious. I thought his mind had been affected. He ran it senselessly about a firing squad and about having shot into the air. As for Titus, I didn't visit him until several weeks after George returned. I knew George was lying, hallucinating if you prefer. The moment he got back from the front, the only thing I didn't believe was that he'd shot into the air. I was sure he had deserted, and his lies were designed to cover up his cowardice. He had been the one who had stayed home when the rest of us had gone out in the barricade several months earlier. In his ravings, he called Nachalo a reactionary. He called him everything short of a defector. He said he and Titus had run into Nachalo at the front, and Nachalo hadn't greeted his former friends as comrades, but as red butchers. He acted as if Nachalo were the enemy. 
then you admit that the apparatus Alberts and Zabron and you served was opposed to what Natchelow and his comrades in the militia were fighting for. I admit nothing of the sort, Sophia. The so-called conflict between the militia and the popular army was a lie spread by the fascists. They were both in one and the same army, the Union's army, the armed working class, the most devoted, most revolutionary workers. Everything we did in the rear, even my activity as a transportation delegate and tram driver, was a contribution to the popular army's victory, the Union's victory, Natchelow's victory, which were all one and the same victory. The militia was nothing but the first detachments of the popular army. That's not true, Louisa. The popular army absorbed the militia into itself the same way you absorbed Natchelow into the Union, and it destroyed all those it couldn't absorb. That's why Natchelow called Alberts and Zabron Red Butchers. You knew more about it when you were ten years old. Red Butchers is what the fascists called the entire working class. George learned the term from the fascists, and he used it to excuse his desertion. I went to see Titus in the hospital as soon as he was allowed visitors. He told me neither he nor George could have had a conversation with Natchelow at the front. Titus also told me he had learned from Natchelow's comrades that Natchelow had died bravely, heroically, fighting the fascists. He died exactly as he had lived. The unit was defeated because of the overwhelming odds against them, because of fascist sabotage in the rear, and also because of some defections. All he said about George was that he had done the best he knew how to do, but I already knew what George could and couldn't do, so he didn't have to tell me more. When I told him what rumors George was spreading among Natchelow's friends, Titus grew alarmed. He thought, and I agreed, that such rumors could destroy the morale of fighting workers and do untold harm. As soon as he came out of the hospital, Titus and I arranged a memorial meeting for Natchelow. It was the last union meeting held in my apartment. All of Natchelow's and Margarita's comrades who had remained in the rear attended the meeting. None returned from the front. Titus gave the main oration. He admitted he had never met Natchelow, but he told everything he had learned from Natchelow's comrades. Natchelow had died like a working-class hero fighting alongside his comrades. The victory of the popular army had been his first priority, and he had urged sacrificing everything for the sake of that victory. He was determined to die before allowing a single fascist soldier to encroach on the accomplishments of the workers. Albert said nothing during the entire meeting. He never again repeated those rumors about Natchelow. I'm amazed he was so shameless as to repeat those rumors to Sabina years later. You're the one who's shameless, Louisa. You're lying. You've been lying to yourself for thirty years. Yaristan asked Titus about the popular army only a few days ago. Titus called it a mistake, a big mistake. What Titus told Yaristan didn't con conflict with what Alberts told Sabina. It conflicted with everything you're telling me. The popular army was a monster that devoured revolutionaries. It turned against the very workers who initiated that struggle, just like the Union. I don't know what you're talking about, Sophia, and I'm losing interest. Your lifelong friendship with Sabina hasn't made you very bright. When I first met Natchelow, he was an isolated individualist terrorist. I know Sabina admires that type of person, but I didn't know you did. It was thanks to me that Natchelow became a devoted union militant, admired by thousands of his fellow workers. He became a virtual myth to them, the very symbol of the collectivist worker united with his comrades in the uncompromising struggle for the class of liberation. I can't imagine what Titus might have told Yaristan. I'm not surprised that it conflicted with what I'm saying. Titus and I disagreed about many things, especially about the form that the unity of the working class should take. I emphasized the union. He emphasized councils and other political forms. But there was one thing we didn't disagree about, and that was the need for organization. We were both collectivists, first of all. We both knew that the struggle was a class struggle, not an individual struggle. So you lured Natchelow into an apparatus that turned against his struggle, an apparatus that ultimately destroyed him. You lured him with your body, but you didn't do it for yourself, for your own gratification. You didn't do it out of any love for him. Natchelow was no more to you than Yaristan was, than Ted is. You took Yaristan to the stockroom and then to your bedroom for the sake of the organization. Louisa, flushed with anger, jumped at me, pinned me back against the couch, and hissed at me. You're asking for it, Sophia, and you're going to get it. If you stare like a deaf mute, or if I see a tear in your eye, I'm going to send you flying out the door for good. You're so green with jealousy, you can't even keep your topic straight. Hypocrite, you're not the one to lecture me about drawing a line between love and politics. You're the one who draws that line, not I. You were a political bureaucrat already before you lost your first teeth. If I had your life experience behind me, I wouldn't have the nerve to lecture about the division between private and political life. I've never in my life drawn such a line. Yes, I wanted Natchelo for his political potentialities, and I simultaneously wanted him in bed, just as I wanted Yaristan in the stockroom, or wherever I felt like it. I was a free and independent person in political and union matters. I was also free and independent in sexual matters. I was no one's wife, woman, or servant. When some people considered me George Albert's wife, I made it perfectly clear with Yaristan just what I thought of wifery. When I became disgusted with Yaristan's lump in politics, 
I got simultaneously disgusted with his lovemaking, and I left him as freely as I'd gone to him. And that's what you can't stand, Sophia. The freedom. The independence. You started the wrong argument with me, Jose's woman. I know too damn much about you, and I no longer have any reason to keep it inside me. I don't know where the hell you came from. Don't you lecture me about Nachalo. You've never even wanted to taste freedom and independence. You're completely shameless to bring up Shiaras down. For at least a year I didn't touch him. I left him completely alone. He was at our house at least twice a week, and I could see your whole body was shaking with desire. You must have been like jelly inside. But you didn't make a move on your own. You just stared with that cowardly, longing, absent look, like a dog begging to be fed, like a slave waiting to be carried off, like a spineless thing waiting to become Yaristan's woman. Don't interrupt until I'm finished. It so happens that your friends kept me informed of the fact that you never changed. You remained a spineless coward. Lem gave me a complete picture of your daring affair with that high school hoodlum Ron. The daring was all exhausted in his petty thefts and antics. You are Ron's girl, a pliant thing, his shadow, the woman behind the he-man. Alec completed a picture I hadn't wanted to believe when I'd first seen it. I can't tell you what intense shame I felt when I learned that my daughter, Nachalo's daughter, had become Jose's woman, Jose's slave, Jose's rag. Don't you talk to me about living up to what Nachalo stood for. How depraved could you get? Nothing in your life forced you to negate your freedom, your self-respect, your independence so completely. Yet you talk about drawing lines. You, who degraded yourself so despicably for your bedfellows, turned into a passionless prude for your political comrades. Jose's woman the sex bomb, was all wit and sexless intellect with Damon and Alec. Yes, Alec told me, and even if he hadn't, I would have guessed it from Damon's unbelieving shock at your display of sexuality with your newest tamer, that boy. I bit my lip during the entire tirade. The desire to respond by crying left me before Louisa was through. You're absolutely right. I gave myself to Jose completely, all of me. I desired him for myself. My insides longed for him from morning to night. For myself, Louisa, not for my project my politics, my organization, I'd be happy to be Jose's woman today. I'd die of shame before I admitted having any such desire, she hissed. Because you've never had any real desires, I shouted as I moved across the room from her. All you've ever had inside you was the organization. I admit my desire, and I admit it proudly, Louisa. I didn't become independent of you until I admitted having my kind of desire, my kind of love. Don't shove your type of independence in my face any more, because I no longer want it. I killed Jose by transforming my kind of love into yours, by replacing my passion with politics, by feeling ashamed of being Jose's woman, by dragging Jose into battles I wasn't able to fight, just as you dragged Nachalo. You can't hide your depravity with such vicious attacks, Sophia. They all miss their mark. You're the one who's depraved, Louisa. I couldn't become independent until I figured that out. You picked Nachalo and Yaristan off the streets, lumpen you called them, individualistic terrorists, and you fixed them up. You funneled them into your organization your so-called union, that thing you served that was greater than your own life. You didn't love them, but it. Your only desire was to make them serve it. I didn't serve Jose, and I didn't make him serve. I loved Jose. You never loved anything but an abstraction in the mouth of a daemon, an Albert's, a Zabron. You're marvelous at playing with words, Sophia. That's all you've ever been good at. I've never outdone you at playing with words, Louisa. You're the organizer, not I. You're the one who mystified language for me as far back as I can remember. You always spoke of working people, and you made me think you actually had working people in mind. But you never had real people in mind at all, but something abstract, something religious people call God. Sabina and Margarita called you a priestess, and I was always too dense to understand what they meant. I finally understand, Louisa. I finally grasped the meaning of those words you played with, words like working people, and union, and we ourselves, and labor movement. To you, they were all synonyms for the ultimate authority. Your freedom and independence were synonyms with slavery, with submission to the ultimate authority. In practice, he used the word union to mean submission to the spokesmen of the union, the carriers of the ideas of the workers, submission to bureaucrats like Titus Zabron and Damon Hesper, submission to technocrats like George Alberts, and your malicious distortions can't justify your submission to Jose, your total and shameless self abandonment to a petty tyrant. You have to use the word petty, don't you, Louisa? Because the tyrants you served weren't petty tyrants. They were just tyrants with a big T. They were institutional tyrants, people whose social slots gave them the power to manipulate and destroy human lives. It's not hard for me to imagine what Alberts and Zabron would be today if their popular army had been victorious, and it can't be very hard for you. One of your authorities actually made it to the top. You must have sensed as far back as 20 years ago that you had come across another high priest when you reached out for Mark Gladney. I obviously knew he wasn't going to spend his life working in that plant, Sophia. You said it, mother, and that's what appealed to you about him. You knew he was moving straight to the top and the top is what you've always worshipped and served. 
Alec told me how irrational you could become, Sophia. He even told me you tried to kill him with a bottle once. I didn't believe him. Alec was right. You're a raving maniac. I was just coming to Alec. How dumb I was. I thought he was taking advantage of you just to spite me, and I felt sorry for you. It's taken me all these years to see you who you are. What was Alec to you, Louisa? Was he a natural or an Albert's? Was he a lumpen to organize or an authority for whose sake you organized? Louisa put her hands to her ears and shouted, Stop this idiocy, Sophia. There's neither reason nor logic in anything you're saying. I honestly didn't know you were still attached to Alec when you made your dramatic exit ten years ago. I shouted, You didn't take Alec away from me. You took him away from Minnie. You must remember Minnie. She's the lawyer who got you out of jail. She came here once with Alec, and you told me later what nice people my friends were. Minnie loved Alec the way that you never loved anyone. What did you want with Alec? What were your plans? Louisa, still holding her hands to her ears, got up and ran to her bedroom. I thought I saw tears in her eyes. I ran after her, shouting, Answer me! What purpose could Alec have served in your apparatus? Louisa lay on her bed, sobbing, her face buried in her pillow. I felt tears rushing to my eyes. All my tension suddenly snapped, and my fury seemed to flow out of me. I sat down next to her and felt sorry for her. Louisa mumbled into the pillow, I'm afraid of you, Sophia. I couldn't hold my tears back any more. How do you expect me to react to that, I asked her. That's so unfair, Louisa. You wanted me not to stare or cry. For once in my life I didn't, only to be told you're afraid of me. I didn't force myself on you, Louisa. You pulled me here. Louisa sat up next to me and wiped the tears from her eyes. You're right, Sophia. I brought you here. I always wanted you to be proud and defiant. But I guess I can't take the defiance when it's aimed at me. You hurt me, Sophia, far more than you seem to think. Alec was of no use to me, or to my politics, or to my organization. I loved him. It was as simple as that. I had no Machiavellian motives. I only wanted to be loved by him. But he rushed into this house looking for me. Only the first time, Sophia, when he and Minnie came to tell me you had disappeared from the university dormitory. Alec wanted to call the police, but I begged him not to. I told him they'd have called me if something had happened to you. Your friends thought I was terribly nonchalant when I told them you'd turn up eventually. I obviously suspected you'd gone back to your high school friends. Alec came again two weeks later on a Sunday. He told me he had found you and that you had telephoned me. He looked me up and down. I wasn't used to it and I was flattered. I didn't know then that he looked every woman up and down. I asked him in. He told me about the newspaper work he had both done. I asked him to come again. He called me a week later and told me he wanted to talk to me. He wanted to learn all about me. It had been so many years since anyone had wanted to know anything at all about me. I invited him to dinner. I spent that whole Saturday preparing for his visit. We ate by candlelight. He told me you had joined Sabina and her friends. I thought your pal Ron was still among them, and I spoiled that evening for myself by telling Alec that Ron had been your boyfriend in high school. Alec thought I meant Jose, and he became intensely jealous. He left before he even finished the meal. I begged him to stay. I cried. I felt old and abandoned. I wiped tears away from Louisa's cheeks and told her, I'm sorry I included Alec. I didn't know anything about your relationship with him. I didn't know that you could love someone in that way. I never reached the point of wanting to be Alec's woman, she said without hostility. But I'm not being honest about that either. I wanted to be desired. I craved Alec's love even more than Natchelo's. Maybe Alec came here looking for you. Maybe he even came to me so as to spite you. But he found me, Sophia, and he loved me for two wonderful years. He phoned me two or three times during the week when you had decided to move back into your room. He asked about you, but he never asked to talk to you. I invited him to dinner again. I told you I was expecting a visitor on that Saturday night. You told me you were going to a movie and might not be back all night. As soon as Alec knocked, I started shaking with passion. We embraced in the doorway. I asked if he wasn't hungry. Starving, he told me. So was I. As soon as we were done eating, I told him he could learn everything about me he wanted to know. He was very concerned that you might return. I told him, I don't interfere with her life, and I suppose she feels the same way about mine. After all, this is my house, too. He told me I looked and acted like your younger sister, and he meant it. I hadn't been loved since we moved into this house. I let Alec learn everything he wanted to on the living room couch. I didn't expect you to reappear so suddenly, nor to stare at us so stupidly with your hand on the doorknob. You made us both feel so indecent. But you didn't spoil my night, Sophia. That was my most wonderful night since my first night with Natula. The following morning you were gone. What could I call you except a Puritan and hypocrite? The fact is, I was relieved. I think Alec was, too. We spent that Sunday outdoors, picnicking and running through a park. I learned that Alec had lost his job and had no place to stay. This is an immense house, and it'll be empty again, I told him. He asked, don't you expect her to come back? Eventually, in three or four years, I told him. Don't you care, he asked. I told him, I care very much. I care most for her sudden arrivals and departures. 
They're the only sign that she has anything in common with me. He stayed not in your room, but in mine. Maybe you're right about my other relationships. I know that my relationship with Alec was different from all the others. I suppose you could call it pure love, or pure sex. There was nothing political in it. I hadn't engaged in any political activity since we emigrated. And maybe you're not altogether wrong about my combination of love with politics. I know that as soon as politics entered our, into our relationship, our love was over. Alec read all the books I had, even the ones I brought over. That was his first language, too, you know. Toward the end of the second year here, he started asking about Nachalo and about the popular army and the barricades. He also became very talkative about himself. That was when he told me about you and Jose, and about Sabina's enterprise. The more he read and talked, the more impatient he became to throw himself into some kind of political activity. I no longer had anything to offer him. My politics seemed sentimental and archaic to him. He learned about an anti-imperialist rally and asked me to go there with him. Alec ran into several of his university friends at that rally. It was there that he introduced me to Lem. That rally only increased Alec's desire to throw himself into political activity. During his last weeks here, he'd spent hours pacing. He was like a caged animal. He said all he wanted was to help make a revolution, with a gun in his hand, and not to talk about it or read about it or support it at rallies or demonstrations. He apparently met people with similar views, and he started going off to political meetings. One day, he simply failed to return. I made no attempt to find him. We were free individuals. But my heart broke. Maybe it was only because I felt myself growing old. I really don't know why, but I've never loved anyone so much. Ever since he left me, I haven't been able to live alone. I had to have someone's love, no matter how modest or flawed. Last year in the committee office, I came across Alec's name on a list of people killed during the riot. I couldn't bear it, Sophia. You must know how I felt. You loved him once, too. I didn't love Alec until a few days ago, when Minnie told me how he died. I summarized what I had so recently learned from Minnie. He was shot down by machine guns when he tried to run back into the bar. Louisa put her head in my lap and cried. I know what you're thinking, Sophia, but this time you're far away from the truth. I didn't encourage Alec to live or die like that. I didn't organize him or educate him. The kind of politics he and I talked about had nothing in common with that. I know, Louisa. He died for the kind of politics I talked to him about, almost exactly the same way Jose died two years earlier. I'd like to think I was in Alec's heart the day he died, but I don't think I was. You're right about the line I've drawn. Alec was never more to me than a political comrade, a colleague on the newspaper staff. We almost became husband and wife once, but we could never have been lovers. You're staring, Sophia, but don't stop. I'm going to admit something to you. I love you just a slight bit more than I hate you, even when you stare. I'll admit something else. When I saw Alec's name on that list last year, I stared for weeks. I stared at work. I stared at the walls of this house, the walls of my empty bedroom, and I cried my eyes out. I hadn't cried so hard since George had returned from the front and told me Nachalo had died after calling his comrades red butchers. And I'll admit one more thing. After Titus's memorial oration for Nachalo, I turned myself into Nachalo's woman. I suppose I could have turned myself into Alex's woman. You infuriated me before and I lied to you. I don't think it was my principles, my commitment to independence that stopped me. What bothered me about Alec was the social class from which he came. I knew he was born in one of the neo-colonies. He still spoke with a slight accent when I first met him. What bothered you about that, I asked. I suppose he wouldn't have told you. He wasn't proud of his class origins. He came from a family of wealthy landowners. His father worked as an army doctor during the war, and afterward he started a successful practice here. Then Alec and his mother settled here. Alec attended high school at a private boarding school. It was there that he was introduced to politics by the daughter of one of the wealthiest lawyers in the city, a girl called Rhea. It was for love of her that Alec started to turn against his class, and he apparently continued moving in the same direction until the day he died. I was no more than a station along the way. If Alec's class or origins bothered you, how could you possibly stand Lem Issel after Alec left you, I asked. Lem's class origins were the same as Alec's, and Lem's personality was so revolting, I found him insupportable already in high school. I was far lonelier after Alec left me than I had ever been before he'd come here. But that wasn't the only reason, Sophia. At first I found Lem interesting, and in the end I did exactly what she threw in my face. I tried to make something out of him, something political. Alec introduced me to Lem at that rally he took me to. Some weeks after Alec left me, Lem knocked on the door. He introduced himself as Alec's friend and your one-time university friend, and started asking me all kinds of questions. Had I known George Alberts? Did I know Alberts was a spy? Did I know you had been responsible for Lem's imprisonment and nearly his death? I was stunned and invited him in. Then he told me a horrendous story about a letter you had sent with him, which had caused his imprisonment. I imagine you had tried to send a note to one of your former comrades, 
and the police had intercepted it. I knew how hysterical that police was about communication from emigres. I told him I had nothing to do with Alberts for over ten years, and tried to tell him you couldn't have intended to harm him with Renault, but he seemed convinced that you as well as his other former comrades had turned against him, betrayed him. He spoke already about wanting to escape from what he called civilization. I felt sorry for him and asked him to visit me again. He came the very next day and invited me to join him at an event he called a witness. We stood for several hours in freezing cold weather. I missed the point. I brought Lem home to ask him about the peace movement. I learned his father had completely disowned him. I told him your room was free and he moved in. In your fury, you placed your finger into an open sore, Sophia. I know how revolting Lem was. I moved into your room with him and I shared your room with him for over a year. I didn't love Lem. At first I felt sorry for him. Later I despised him. But I still went to him. I thought I was helping him. I thought I was making him useful to the movement, the peace movement, since nothing else was available at the time. I thought I was encouraging him to remain politically active. But you're wrong if you think that by using my body I always succeeded. Len never became useful to anyone or anything. He became increasingly irrational, mystical. He hallucinated about rustic solitude. He stopped taking part in any of the peace movement activities. He just sat with his leg on the kitchen table and called me his jailer. I started attending peace movement activities without him. I got to know Art. It was long past midnight. I called Ted to learn how he'd gotten home from the repression committee and to tell him I was spending the night with Luisa's. So you thought I wanted to take Ted from you, Luisa commented. I didn't know you loved him. Not that I cared. I was still fuming about the scene you'd made in front of Damon. I used to hate Ted, I told her. We share a house, but not a bed. I didn't know I loved him until I saw you bent over him. Louisa and I had breakfast the following morning before she left for her job. I took a taxi home. I apologized to Ted for having left him stranded in the repression committee office. He told me he'd gotten a ride home with Damon. He asked why I thought it necessary to call him the previous night. Do you remember what you thought I intended to do to Tina the night I ran naked from Tissy's room? I asked him. I don't understand, he said sadly. Yesterday I was convinced Louisa wanted to do the same thing to you, Ted. But you're not seven, and I didn't feel any urge to protect you. What I felt was a jealousy, intense jealousy. I thought Louisa was going to ravage a person I loved very much. Ted stared at me with tears in his eyes. No one ever said anything like that to me, Sophie. I think I love Ted, but I'm not sure I can distinguish my love from guilt and pity. I feel guilty because I had thought him seven-year-old Tina's lover, and even more because I had thought myself responsible for keeping them apart. I felt pity toward him ever since I learned of his lifelong, unreciprocated devotion to Tissy. My life would have been very different if I had become Ted's friend in the garage twelve years ago, the friend he sought so desperately. I can't describe him better than Sabina described him to me then. He's lucidly aware of the difference between people and things. He's satisfied when he's shaping his environment with his companions, and has no desire to shape his companions or be shaped by them. I don't want to be either his mentor or his woman, but I haven't learned to be anything else. The liberating politics you and I learned didn't leave either of us very liberated. Please let me know what Myrna and Yara do to make you aware of that fact. I'm on their side, Yara Stan, but only because I'm far away. From here it's easy to be on their side. I still love you, but no longer as a god. I feel just a little bit sorry for you. Yours, Sophia.